Hello and welcome to the second um, panel event of the day in our virtual conference on delivering net zero. I'm Emma Norris and I'm the Director of Research at the Institute for Government. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to our conference sponsors, uh, the Association of British Insurers, the Association for Project Management, uh, Imperial College London, the Transition to Zero Pollution Initiative and Novo Nordisk. Now for this session we're going to be discussing one of the crucial questions for net zero, how can governments get the public on board? And um, this event is on the record and we'll be live tweeting using the hashtag IFG net zero. Now we know that net zero cannot be delivered without political and public consent for change. Polls indicate rising public concern about the climate, but there are questions about whether the public have been confronted with the scale of change that will be required of them from what they eat to how they travel. Last year, six select committees sponsored the Climate Assembly, bringing together a selection of citizens to talk about how we can reach net zero. And the Climate Change Committee recently called for government's net zero plan to include a strategy for public engagement. For the next hour, um, the panelists and I are going to be discussing the role of public engagement in net zero, why engagement is so critical to delivering the target, which areas or policies should be prioritised for engagement, what kind of role citizens' assemblies can play um, and where the work of Climate Assembly UK should go next. And then we might also touch on whether there are ever circumstances in which government should avoid asking the public what they think. I'm very lucky to have a fantastic panel to discuss these questions and more with me. I've got Darren Jones MP, who is chair of the House of Commons Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Select Committee. Chris Stark, the chief executive of the Climate Change Committee. Becky Willis, professor in practice at Lancaster University and an expert lead for the Climate Assembly UK. And Dear Mid Tawney, an associate professor at Dublin City University and an expert advisor for the Irish Citizens Assembly on climate change. Now, very shortly, I'm going to come to the panel to start. But before then, I'm delighted to introduce Dorade Nielsen, um, the Vice President for Corporate Environmental Strategy at Novo Nordisk, one of our sponsors today, um, who's going to give a few introductory remarks. Dorade, over to you. Thank you very much uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to introduce uh, this session. It's really a privilege. Uh, Novo Nordisk is a global pharmaceutical company headquartered in Denmark and environmental responsibility and sustainability is right at the heart of everything we do and has been for many decades. Uh, in 2019, we made this commitment that over the coming years, we want to reduce our environmental impact to zero by transforming our business into a circular economy. So far, we have switched all our global manufacturing plants to use 100% renewable power and have initiated a plan to ensure that by 2030, our entire supply chain will be based on 100% renewables. Within the same time frame, we also aim to have zero CO2 emissions from our operations and transport. Our commitment benefits Novo Nordisk by allowing us to become less dependent on external resources as well as reducing our waste. Our contribution to, to the reduction of carbon emissions helps also prevent climate change to the benefit of all. Helping society find ways to reduce carbon emissions and waste are areas where companies, politicians and the public can and should work together. Companies can evolve their ways of doing business and politicians can help them by providing the legislation and engagement needed to secure the development of environmentally sound solutions. In New Nordisk, we have in recent years uh, experienced very good examples of this uh, type of collaboration. Back in 2010, Danish government approvals were granted for the building of an offshore windmill farm capable of supplying Novo Nordisk and many Danish households with renewable power. This was only possible due to a combination of politicians and companies. Politicians drove a green agenda with included legislation to provide subsidies and forward thinking companies like Novo Nordisk were willing to make a 10 year commitment to purchase power from this windmill farm at an agreed cost which enabled the upfront investment to be secured. A more recent example of collaboration occurred last year when Novo Nordisk initiated a pilot with many partners to explore the possibility of collecting used medical devices for recycling purposes. We worked together with national and local governments, other Danish companies and patient organizations to develop a circular economy solution where we both secured resources through recycling of plastic components while at the same time removing plastic waste from the environment. The public involvement in the form of patients was very critical, both in designing a take back system that were practical at an individual level, in developing a relevant and motivating information campaign, and in identifying the best communication channels to deliver this campaign. 
This pilot project was only possible because local and national politicians were willing to engage with the public and other partners to develop new ways of collecting and managing pharmaceutical waste products. So finally, looking to the future, we believe that partnerships between governments, institutions and private enterprises, coupled with public engagement, is a very strong way to drive innovation to secure sustainable business solutions for the benefit of the environment. I look very much forward to this discussion in this session to explore new ways forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, OK, we're going to kick off uh, the event now. It's worth saying to those of you watching, please send in your questions as soon as you have them. I'm going to make sure that we've got at least 20 minutes um, at the end of the discussion to put your questions to the panel. So start sending them in now and um, I'll make sure your questions are asked. Chris, I'm going to come to you first. Um, the Climate Change Committee recently set out in its sixth carbon budget. What actions do you think the government needs to take to get the UK all the way to net zero? And you specifically mentioned the need for strategy on public engagement. Why is public engagement so important for net zero? Thanks, Emma. And it's a, it's a really good question. We published this tome of work before Christmas on how the UK should get to net zero. And, you know, fairly, fairly obviously it involves a lot of change. So progressively shifting away from fossil fuels, also big changes in things like land use. And, you know, that is a, a, a major task and it's not going to happen uh, through the, the kind of old paradigm. So that we, we've, we've got pretty far with this idea that we can centrally plan policy especially energy policy, and the recipients for that policy can be big corporates making big changes. What's next is a much more atomized thing. And I think to me, that's much more interesting. We need to get the incentives right for, for millions of people to change their, their preferences to take us on the, on the path to net zero, uh, to invest in those zero carbon technologies and, 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 and assets that will get us there, but crucially also to reduce consumption of the high, gar high carbon goods and services that, are, that drive emissions at the moment. So public engagement is really at the heart of that. Just a few a few takes on, on why I think it's important. Firstly, on this topic of fairness and perhaps on jobs too. Uh, we already know that fairness is an issue when it comes to decarbonisation. Most of the policy costs uh, of decarbonisation are sitting on electricity bills. We just haven't noticed that. So, you know, that's an interesting thing to think about in and of itself. But one of the major insights in our most recent work is that the cost of net zero in aggregate is now very low. Uh, that's mainly because we've seen plummeting costs for um, for low carbon electricity, which we can we can see playing out across the economy. So we have a, a low aggregate cost. I know you'll be talking about that later today, but that's masking a much more a difficult question of how you how you allocate those costs and indeed the benefits across the economy and there's a much more difficult set of challenges there so all sorts of distributional questions big changes in employment that go with that the task here is that we have savings in what in some areas of the economy crucially in, in things like transport we now think that will be saving to the economy and big costs in other parts of the economy notably the challenge of decarbonizing industry and buildings so spreading that out in a way that is perceived to be fair will not happen unless we think about, of course, the big fiscal tools, but also unless we have a public discussion about what lies ahead. So that moment for that public discussion, I think, is really on us, upon us now when we think about coming out of the recession. The fiscal consolidation is going to begin at some point. We estimate four to seven billion pounds of exchequer funding is needed by 2030. Uh, just to just to get on track for net zero, so you can't hide that from from public discourse. So that that question of fairness, I think, is something we have to start opening up. Secondly, lifestyle changes. So lifestyle changes really come into view as one of the major underpinning factors in the transition. There's a chart that I use a lot when I speak publicly as pie chart that looks at the emissions reductions that are necessary to 2035. About two fifths of them are, are pure technology shifts, the kind of things that we've been doing very well in the UK over the last 10, 15 years, closing power plants, uh, switching fuels, things that consumers don't tend to notice. But the rest of it involves uh, some element of uh, behaviour change. So that is a pretty key insight, and it's one of the reasons why we're saying that those lifestyle changes that underpin those changes really need to be something we start talking about and indeed engaging uh, collectively around. So they will be a barrier if we don't see them happen. So a good example might be diet change. Diet change, uh, yes, it reduces emissions if we, if we switch from, from meat, but it also, it also opens up the question of how you do land use change. So that question really is it, kind of that challenge, I suppose, to government is it's no longer really about what we need to do to get to net zero. It's really about how, how we do it. 
and that's the kind of new frontier for policy and that's my kind of final point i suppose in in, in this in this intro really that that we need to think about how we target policy more effectively here we're going to have to stop thinking potentially about climate change as being the only driver for all this instead i think we're going to have to talk about things like community renewal uh, you know, we're going to have to do things in towns and cities right across the city, right across the whole country, and we're going to have to be excited about those changes. And uh, you know, that opens up a whole new question of how we, how we, how we start that discussion. And I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, you know, it can be a miserable discussion if we don't get it get it right. Uh, we, there are lots of jobs here, lots of changes that involve lots of, uh, I think, really exciting things that can happen community by community. But we won't do that unless we start that process. So we've been big advocates of starting the process of local planning as a means to uh, open up the optionality and open up the questions of where we go next. And for me, that's the exciting thing. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't see at the moment that we've got policy in the right place for that, but there's lots of opportunity to get that right, Emma. Thanks, Chris, and really helpful way of setting out the kind of why public engagement is so important. And the question you raise around how we start this discussion. Um, Dimit, I might come to you on this. You were an expert advisor on the Irish Citizens Assembly on Climate, and you've got some expertise in running these kinds of initiatives. Could you talk us through what kind of impact um, the Citizens Assembly has had and what Ireland is doing to build on it? Because, you know, this is one of the ways that we start that discussion. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Emma, and thanks for the invitation to uh, participate in this this panel. I'm looking forward to the discussion over, over the hour ahead. Um, Ireland has had nearly a decade of experience now of running processes like citizens' assemblies at national level, and it really started from a, a belief that uh, the the crisis, the the last crisis, uh, the financial crisis, hit Ireland particularly hard. And for homegrown reasons, that there was, there was a crisis of governance. So about a decade ago, some academic colleagues uh, began to experiment with um, citizens' assemblies, um, uh, and that led then to government uh, picking this up. And we, we're now in our, our third national citizens' assembly. So there was one called the, the Constitutional Convention. Then there was the citizens' assembly that focused on climate change uh, among uh, five topics. And now we have a citizens' assembly on gender equality that is currently ongoing. So, so Ireland has has something of a track record um, of these kinds of processes, and 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 that's important for a reason that I'll come to back to in in, in a minute. Um, so, picking up on some of what Chris talked about there, um, deliberative processes like citizens' assemblies are, are useful because they help to navigate a way through the kinds of challenges that, that Chris pointed to. They're, 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 they've been found to be particularly good at dealing with complex um, long-term policy challenges that involve value conflicts, that involve trade-offs, the, the kinds of, of challenges that, that Chris was was outlining, but I think it's important also to, to say that they're not a panacea. You know, we, we can't expect them to do all of the, the heavy lifting. They're one part of this public engagement strategy, but they're not they're, they're not a, a silver bullet. And in, in terms of the lessons we've learned uh, here in Ireland, I, I'd uh, identify maybe three to start off with, and I'd be happy to talk more as the, the discussion unfolds. And the first is that the process matters, getting the process right uh, and, and being open and transparent about how it's designed uh, is, is important and involving the participants in designing the, the process. So not, not giving the impression that it's a done deal, you know, that it's, it's simply an exercise, a citizens assembly is simply an exercise for, for politicians to you know, get, get the answer that they, they were looking for. So be, being transparent, but also open about the process is, is important. The second point I'd emphasize is that I, I think experience matters. So um, these, these kind of processes like citizens assemblies are, are, are quirky, they're, they're unusual, they're, they're things that at the first go, the public and also policymakers and civil society and industry and might be nervous about it. They might not fully understand how it works. So I think the more countries or regions or, or local governments run these kinds of processes, the more familiar and comfortable everyone becomes with them. So, so I, that's where I, I think in Ireland we have that benefit of having this this kind of decade of experience, uh, including 
tackling quite controversial topics like abortion, like gay marriage. So, so I think you know the the more comfortable everyone becomes with running these kinds of processes, uh, the the better. And then the final point I'd make is is that the follow up matters. So for the the participants themselves, but also the, the wider public, it, it's important that. Um, People don't think that it, it was a waste of time, uh, and that there is a you know a, a real and genuine commitment on on the part of policymakers to at least give very serious consideration to to the recommendations. And it, it's great that Darren Jones is is um, on uh, on this panel and, and can talk a bit about that. Our experience in Ireland for both the the abortion topic and also the climate change topic was that a, a dedicated parliamentary committee, a special parliamentary committee was established to take forward the, the recommendations and met over a series of months in both cases to really go through in detail the recommendations that had come out of the Citizens Assembly. And I think that's that, that that's not the only way to, to, to do that follow-up process, but it's uh, I, I think in Ireland it was a helpful way of marrying the outputs of a citizens' assembly with the democratic legitimacy that the parliament uh, can give, but not simply landing the 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 uh, recommendations in the you know the, the general chamber of parliament, giving it to a, a specialised committee that that has the time and space to, to take forward the recommendations. Brilliant, thank you very much, Jim. Becky, I want to come straight to you on the back of that. How does um, Dima's description of, of the Irish experience compare to uh, the Climate Assembly in the UK? Um, did the Assembly open up discussion in the UK, in um, in England and the UK? What's your impression of six months on from, from the report about the response you've had from government? Um, and indeed, how should we build on this? How do we use this as the start rather than the end? Yeah, thanks, Emma. I mean, um, yeah, a, a, a lot of what Dermot says rings true and particularly the you know you have to experience these things so for me you know after sort of six months in the planning walking into that room in Birmingham you know <laughs> this is pre-COVID obviously where you had you know 108 people who were perfectly representative of your country as a whole it's it's really incredible to experience that actually in a real kind of heart-stopping moment so and, and 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 we tended to find that people who came and observed we had a lot of MPs and journalists and civil society who came to observe and join us in Birmingham and that was really important so I'd really echo what what Dermot said about that in terms of what's happened since I mean it's been great to see it taken forward in all sorts of ways. I mean, Darren, who's here today, um, led a debate on the floor of the House. That was really good to see and very, you know, very vigorous cross-party debate. So that 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 was good um, as well. Um, seeing how the uh, Climate Change Committee have incorporated it into their evidence and um, you know, I'm saying this in front of Chris, and feel free to disagree, Chris. But but the impression I get is that is that is that the, the Climate Change Committee has come to see how this kind of evidence can be used, not to replace, but to complement um, technical analysis, modelling, and so on. Um, We've done, I think, uh, four. We, we, we've done, I mean, countless briefings with with government as well and government departments, and we're sort of in ongoing conversations about how the evidence from the citizens' assembly can feed into the net zero strategy and all the work that's going to um, happen on climate this year. Um, so I, I think the the um, reception has been has has been really positive. It's really sparked a debate amongst sort of climate policymakers. Um, if if I um, I mean, I hate to be that person who quibbles with the question we've been set, but I'm, I, I can't resist. If I have uh, one sort of reservation about this debate is that it's actually what the Climate Assembly showed us. It's not about how governments can get the public on board. Um, it, it's it's um, I mean, I mean, for a start, I mean, all the research I've done with politicians shows that politicians underestimate. They consistently underestimate the levels of public support for climate action. Um, those levels of support are very crudely higher than politicians think, lower than they probably need to be. Um, 
so um, for a start, it's not like government's got all the answers here. Um, but actually, at a deeper level, the, the phrasing around taking the public with us or getting people on board um, is really problematic because it's essentially, you know, what, what, what's been called a deficit model. Um, it assumes that there's a deficit of understanding in the public and that, you know, they're empty vessels that we need to fill with the required mm. knowledge and information and motivation and then they'll be set off. And that's absolutely not true. Um, in fact, um, you know, the, the whole point of processes like Climate Assembly UK is to learn from the lived experience of people who are, as Chris said, going to be part of um, the, going to have to be part of that climate action. Um, and they're going to be, um, you know, doing that not just through their roles as consumers, but through their roles as, 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 as citizens, as active participants in society, as voters, obviously. Um, and uh, so they're, they're they're doing the legwork. It's not just about consuming and how and, and, and behaviour. It's about every aspect of our lives in that way. And the way that I've I've come to sort of think of this is to go back to that you know <laughs> where, where politics started really. The whole idea of the social contract between um, between rulers and ruled. So in this case, you could say citizen and government. Um, it's about citizens saying um, what they need in order to make the changes and government asking how can they support citizens. So it's about the sort of negotiation of that contract between citizens and state. And actually what something like Climate Assembly UK or Citizens Assembly does is sort of negotiate that, that contract in miniature. It's that conversation about, oh, OK, so if we put this, you know, cycling infrastructure or public transport infrastructure in place, you think that you would then, you know, take your kids to school by bike or whatever. Do you see what I mean? So it's the chance for that conversation to try out ideas, to learn from people's lived experience. Um, and, and, and so that's why I think these processes are really useful. And, and, and I think not just that we'll come on to this maybe in discussion, but not just those sort of, you know, the Big Bang um, National Assembly, but looking at how we can feed that deliberation, how we can feed those views and values into all aspects of decision making in Parliament and in government in organisations like Chris's and actually, you know, right across the board when we're thinking about the decisions we make on climate. Brilliant. Thanks, Becky. And absolutely you make a very important point that public engagement is not just about getting people on board but showing politicians that the public is already um, very supportive of, of change in these areas and indeed learning from lived experience to try and improve decision making one thing before we move on um to down that i wanted to ask you about is the citizens same assembly came up with you know a, a kind of large ambitious set of recommendations how do you think government should treat those recommendations should you know are you arguing for them to adopt them wholesale or is that part of the kind of negotiation that you describe how should yeah how should government respond to those recommendations yeah so i think the danger um right i'm going to show you this is this is the final report it is an old style telephone directory that's it how like you it. it's link absolutely yeah. it's absolutely full of um you know really useful insights and and and, and quotes but I think the danger is that um, government and, and the select committees, for that matter, might want to cherry pick the recommendations that they like the look of. And actually, I think the most critical part of, of the Climate Assembly's message is actually in the principles. It's, um, you know, the principle of, of, of fairness that, that Chris raised, which um, ran all the way through their discussions. Um, it's um, another thing that, that, that came out was um, the need for a more locally specific approach. So not top down national policy. Um, there was another principle, interestingly, which I'd be interesting to, interested to get Darren's views on about cross party uh, consensus so that it doesn't become a political football. So I think it's taking on board the spirit of the assembly and those overall th th those overall principles rather than just kind of picking out the, 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 the recommendations that, that government might like the look of that might fit with their agenda. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, and Darren, I want to come to you now. So your committee was one of the sponsors of the Climate Assembly UK and you've committed to scrutinising um, how much of its work is taken up. Um, I guess my first question is, how's that going? Um, what has government's response been? And more broadly, what do you see um, the role of Parliament being in continuing to bring the public on board to involve them in these conversations? Well, th firstly, um, great to be here today. It's a great event and, and, and timely because we've obviously recently had the energy white paper from government, which was long awaited. Um, and it's a, a responsibility of my committee to scrutinise that. Uh, and it's one of those papers that goes cr cross government. 
like the Citizens Assembly report. And the whole way in which committees function is based on evidence. And then we as a cross party group of politicians take a view on the evidence that we've heard and make recommendations to government. So the Citizens Assembly report essentially is a tome of evidence that is used through everything that we now do, irrespective of which particular topic we're looking at in more in more detail. Um, so for one example, we started our inquiry yesterday on decarbonising heat in people's homes. And the Citizens Assembly report with some of its recommendations around uh, zoning and local decision around different types of technologies, understanding some of the concerns around disruption and in the home um, uh, requirements has already been um, fed into our kind of briefs as members of parliament, already formed the basis of some of our questions to um, experts when they're appearing before the committee. So it's kind of in, it's entwined in our DNA now because it is such an important um, representative sample and evidence base of the British people as a whole, which as politicians, we don't easily get very often. We all represent our own individual constituencies, but representing a constituency like Bristol Northwest is very different to representing another constituency in another part of the country. And so this, this evidence is useful to us as parliamentarians because it gives us that country wide view in a way that has confidence about the outcomes. It's not just our interpretation of the country is what we're being told is the view of constituents across the country. And I think that's, that's you know, it's not just on my committee. Um, there's cross um, there's cross committee interest in net zero and transition. I'll give you one example. Uh, my committee is coordinating all of the committee's submissions to the COP26 um, conference. Um, and there was 11 committees that wanted to do individual events on net zero um, work or some aspects of the net zero transition um, at the COP conference. And that wasn't including colleagues in the House of Lords, which as well, you know, we'll be working with as well. So you can see that it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about um, communities and local government or transport or education or the treasury or you know my committee and as a consequence MPs that are interested in those areas of departmental work it is something that is enormously topical now across parliament which I think is um, uh, welcome um, and I think it means that the citizens assembly report will have traction with a much higher number of MPs than just those of us that have always been interested in these issues. Fantastic. Thank you, Darren. And I wanted to um, just briefly touch on the question of cross party cooperation that Becky raised. Um, you know, how do you feel that's going? Um, where do you think it's going next, given it is clearly such a crucial part of long term policy making and consensus in this area? Well, I suppose there's always been a slightly different approach to the way in which we operate on committees versus the way in which the floor of the house works. So, um, you know, in committees, you know, it's part of what we do in terms of cross party consensus because we don't operate effectively unless we, we get to that. Um, but there is broad cross party consensus for many of the issues concluded in the Citizens Assembly report and therefore the work that we're doing. The difficult thing always comes when you start talking about who pays for it and how much they pay. So we're already getting into these discussions, for example, on heat, you know, which is an expensive priority for us as a country. Uh, you know, how much does the taxpayer pay? How much do consumers pay through bills? How much do we raise through private sector finance? Is there a tax question? You know, how does carbon pricing play into these big infrastructure questions? And But those are the decisions that, you know, politicians are tasked with answering. Um, uh, and I'm sure we'll find a way through on a cross-party basis on that way. And the floor of the House, I mean, the whole House of Commons, whether rightly or not, is structured in a way for kind of opposition to government. So there's always going to be some of that. But if you look at the content of contributions across the House, there actually is a, a lot of consensus around many of these issues. Um, uh, I think it's just that how do you get there and which route do you take and who pays and how quickly do you do it where there's a bit of conflict. But that's not a, represent a representation of the Assembly report. That's just sadly politics. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the issues that strikes me is the sheer vastness of net zero. It covers so many sectors, almost, you know, every part of society. Um, I'd like to ask all of the panel, you know, what are the issues where it's most urgent to talk to the public? Um, should government be focusing, for instance, on specific policies? Um, and if so, which policies should it be focusing on? Who wants to dive in first? I mean, I'll kick off. I mean, I, 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 I have a reasonably good view of the things that we need to do across the economy um, and the interesting thing is there's still lots of routes to get get to get to net zero and we spelled out five separate pathways in December for the UK to reach net zero and they're all very different in their in their makeup. The one that really stands out is the is the question of how we decarbonize heat mm -hmm. and, and I think I'm, almost everyone in the panel has raised it today and it's going it's 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 such an important factor for all sorts of reasons. It's also really interesting to me as a, as a, as a, as a kind of mission for the UK. So we, this is at the heart of this is a very obvious thing that we can't keep burning fossil fuels to heat 
homes and, and buildings uh, in perpetuity, or we will not make the, the net zero target we have in the UK increase. We won't solve the problem that climate change uh, that we're seeing of climate change at the moment either. So that question of how we get from here to there is one that everyone, even if they're not steeped in the issues, broadly understands something must be done about that. But the question is we haven't really we haven't really got a good answer on what to do about it. So for me, that the, the, that's exciting. You know, we should think about that not as a as some big looming concern, but instead as something that we need to talk about and get excited about because. There are jobs attached to this kind of transition. I talked about community renewal briefly in my answer. That's exactly what we will we will need to see. We'll need to see uh, you know investment in every town and city throughout the UK over the course of the next 20, 30 years if we're going to meet this challenge of decarbonising buildings. And and you know conservatively we estimate that that's a couple of hundred thousand new jobs. So you know that that kind of discussion is not one that we're having at the moment. I think we've been too obsessed with the technical answers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you get this kind of format war that's playing out at the moment about you know heat pumps versus hydrogen, which is very very niche and very strange if you're not if you're not steeped in it. Instead, we should be talking about what you know what we need to do to bring about local plans for that kind of transition, build local consent for it, make people feel that this is something they've 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 had some purchase over. And 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 for me, that's very exciting. So I, I put that right at the heart of this transition. It's one of the sectoral challenges, of course, but it's it's the next biggie. You know, we are we are well on the way to having decarbonised electricity supply. That was always the kind of first step on this journey. This is the next big one that we need to talk about, and it is tied also to the question of of industry in the future. Uh, you know, what sort of industries we have, uh, where people are going to be employed in the future. If at the end of the street in Teesside you've got a place that's producing low carbon hydrogen, why wouldn't you want to use that in your hydrogen boiler in your home, for example? We need to be less wedded to, to the kind of national technical fix question and more wedded to the question of how we elicit a, you know, a local engagement in the, in, in, in the process that will arrive at the regional plans. Thanks, Chris. Becky, did you want to come in? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a good way of looking at it, because if you look at this not from a kind of technical roadmap perspective, but in fact, from the perspective of political strategy, then the most urgent need is to get a, a, a suite of policies, a strategy which really engages and motivates people and builds momentum. Um, and, um, and, and and not the opposite. So maybe what we saw in France with the Gilets Jaunes, for example, was the opposite, where you had, um, you know, ob ob objections to a very clumsy, um, slightly climate related policy, and, and, and that undid um, a, a lot of goodwill, and in fact, the the, the 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 citizens' assembly in France was in a was in a certain extent, to a certain extent, uh, uh, an attempt to reset that to reset that that um, uh, that attempt by government to to um, to have that dialogue with citizens. So I would say that. Um, you know, the, we, we know what we need to do from a technical perspective, but the challenge is to think about what really engaging and, 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 and motivating policies can we put in place and create this kind of virtuous circle whereby, um, you know, people are, are drawn more into the debate that they see the benefits. And so, um, you know, I'd be interested in the panel's views as to what those, those policies might be, but I think it's definitely around, as Chris was saying, around a local renewal, around uh, livability, um, you know, in for transport infrastructure, which allows us to walk and cycle, that that sort of thing, and and that came came across in the citizens' assembly, um, in terms of food and diet. I mean, you know, rather than starting with a meat tax, um, starting with with some of the things that were suggested, um, in terms of um localized food strategies and support for farmers. So, you know, really focusing in on um what the policies are which will engage and motivate. Thank you. Darren, um, do you have any take on which the policies are that will engage and motivate, as Becky says? Well, firstly, I'm just pleased to hear that there's consensus on the committee that we're doing the right thing in Parliament with our heat inquiry. So that's good news, um, because I think this we, we, we heard yesterday in our first oral evidence session, you know, the big challenges, you know, the, the, the quarter of a uh, I think it's 250 billion pound estimate cost all in all to make this happen. You know, the technology challenges um, around scaling up the hydrogen industry, thinking from an infrastructure and delivery perspective, uh, the concern around heat pumps, meaning you're going to have to replace your radiators and 
pipes and it's going to cost you 15k and who can afford that in their homes um, and then talking about heat networks but thinking that can only work in certain circumstances in certain places and we don't really know how we're going to make that work yet as a country so those are the problems but as Chris said on the other side um, we were told about hundreds of thousands of jobs being created um, jobs where people can transition from doing gas boilers to doing you know combined hydrogen boilers or heat pump installation but the oil and gas industry being able to move um, away from drilling for oil in the North Sea into being able to produce hydrogen capacity. So there's huge amounts of positives around that as well. The concern that I have, and this is something that we'll be looking at as a committee, is how do you engage the public in that process? Because it's uh, my concern is you could very quickly turn people off. Um, so if you there's a you know there was a Downing Street debate on carbon pricing. There's lobbying around levies on the gas industry to try to bring parity between electricity and gas to encourage people to move uh, away from gas. But if people start seeing their bills increase quickly without an explanation as to why that's happening, um, or if people are being told, well, I'm sorry, someone's going to come into your home and have to redo all of your radiators and pipes and you're going to have to pay some money towards all this, you're quickly going to turn people off. Um, and the public perception of heating as a contribution to carbon emissions is quite low. So people rank it quite low after things like um, uh, dietary requirements, airline travel, industrial uh, carbon emissions. Uh, so there, there's still a kind of public understanding gap on this issue. And it's one of those examples where we can build on the work of the Citizens Assembly, because the Citizens Assembly went through the different technologies, the pros and cons, came up with some good conclusions and thoughts around that. Um, but we've still got further work to do in those local communities to say, well, how do you think this is going to roll out in your neck of the woods? And then it's the job of my committee to not just talk to base ministers, but to get MHCLG before the committee and say, well, you guys are responsible for planning and city planning and, and these types of things. And Bayes is thinking about local decisions on technology and zoning. You've really got to work together better and engage with your local and regional elected officials at council and regional morality level to ensure this conversation is happening now, because otherwise we're going to be trying to bring these policy decisions forward um, before having a public conversation locally with people. I think you've got to get it the other way around. That's really helpful. And that brings me on to my next question, Darren, which is the kinds of methods of public engagement we should be using to, to talk about some of these policy choices. Uh, we've talked already about um, citizens assemblies and the climate assembly in particular. Um, are assemblies you know, always the right model or are there other exercises that we should be pursuing to have these conversations? Is that to me, Emma? That's to anybody who would like to answer it. Well, I'll kick off and then if someone else wants to go off. I mean, so my, my view from uh, the kind of receiving end of the Citizens Assembly report is that um, it, it's really it's a really useful model where you want to get into um, detailed explanation, understanding of evidence, informed conclusions and building consensus. Um, I, I don't think we're going to be able to do that in every town and village and city across the country. So there has to be something else that builds off the back of that. And I hope that public engagement will refer to the Citizens Assembly uh, in talking to the public in the future as well as a kind of public evidence that people can look to. Um, my sense is that in the same way that, you know, on the power side, distribution network operators had to um, provide stuff in the post to local households to talk about, um, I don't know, the offer to replace their light bulbs or that some of the things that they've had to do on smart meters through power companies. Uh, we, we need to start working through suppliers and infrastructure providers, as well as local and regional authorities to get things through letterboxes, to get things in front of people, to invite them to be part of briefings or discussions and to have an active conversation with people. And there's a really, you know, from a political side of it, there's a great opportunity there about democratic revival as well. I mean, it's not going to be a vote at the end of it, but there is, I suppose, in a general election um, or, or local or regional elections. But we need to have this as a two way conversation with people because ultimately they're going to be making a decision about what they pay, what technology they have, what they want to have in their homes. Um, and I think you've got to set that example from the beginning, not ignore it and then have problems at the end, which then causes politicians probably quite significant political difficulties in losing the argument with the public. Thanks, Darren. Um, Damon, I wonder whether you wanted to come in on the what methods of engagement should we use? Yeah, I, I would agree with a lot of what, what Darren said about um, a, a large scale national citizens assembly being a, a kind of, not necessarily a once off, but it, it, it's not something that logic would suggest you would um you know do, do repeatedly on on the same topic um so uh i 
I, I might differ a little bit from Darren in, in that there are small scale models like citizen juries which have actually been um, rolled out you know, in, in various local authorities in, in the UK um, on, on climate change and, and related topics. So, so there are scaled down versions of a citizen's assembly that can be um, you know, tailored to local uh, policy questions. Uh, and that are much cheaper to do because they, you know, they, one of the other challenges with something like climate assembly UK is the cost. Um, you know, that they are very expensive processes uh, to 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 run. So, so I think there are elements of the citizens assembly model, and um, you know, the, the strength of it is that it brings together a you know a, a, a representative sample of of the public, including those that won't. Come to a, you know, a, a, a an information session, and, and that's the 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 strength of of, of the the sortition model. And I think the challenge with the kind of thing that the Saren was talking about, where you put you know leave it through a letterbox and, and ask people to participate. You know, the Darren as a, as a politician, you would know this much better than than the rest of us. That you you know that tends to get a certain cohort of the population involved. We know with climate change that we need to reach beyond those um, the, those already engaged, either positively or, or negatively. So, so I, I, I would suggest that there are elements of the, the climate assembly model that can, can be down, downscaled to, to local level, but, but I think it's important to bring it down to the local level and picking up on what Becky and, and Chris said and um, you know, connecting with the the kinds of challenges that that local communities are are yeah, are involved with, and folding it into discussions about community renewal and and revival, uh, and you know, perhaps getting away from the language of net zero. Net zero makes sense for people like us, but you know, it's it's a, a very technocratic um way of, of of thinking about these these challenges. So um finding the right language as as well as the, the, the right institutional mechanisms I think is important. Thank you. Um Chris, Becky, what are some of the barriers to um, pursuing kind of public engagement and public conversation on the kind of things we're talking about? You know, we've had a really compelling case for public engagement, a um, really strong articulation of the kind of policies that we want to talk to people about. Is there anything standing in the way of government doing that? Uh, Becky might well have something. I mean, I might just chip in on that, just to perhaps follow up something that Dermot said, which I fundamentally agree with, which is that this is not all going to kind of hang off net zero. I mean, I think it is absolutely necessary for us to have a, you know, a, a, a genuinely central view of what's happening on emissions reduction, and net zero is a is a binding, uh, you know, a binding constraint, but a, a, a motivating factor for some people, but not for not for everyone. In fact, not for the majority. So we're going to have to turn this into a richer discussion about the changes that we are going to see over the next twenty and thirty years. And again, I'll I'll just just say this one more time that we're going to have to inject a bit of optimism into this, a bit of a kind of positivity about those changes, because otherwise they will they will not be they will not be well received. I suspect. So for me, this points to a discussion about answering your question, Emma. What kind of new jobs opportunities there will be? Uh, I've mentioned community re renewal a few times, but we're going to be facing community renewal questions anyway after this pandemic. So, kind of bringing those things together, what does it mean for people to live in a community? Uh, and perhaps the perceptions of that community may have shifted in the last twelve months. And what what steps lie ahead for the changes in that community that where we where we live? You know, drawing in the net zero discussion into those things. Uh, you, these are all really exciting things. If you put them together in that way, but they are barriers if we don't tackle them. So I mentioned in my in my intro answer, Emma, that one of the big barriers is land use change, just to stand back from net zero. We have to change at landscape level what's happening across the UK or we won't make net zero. That's the, the kind of the net bit of it is the is the carbon that we manage to store in the natural environment. Now that rests ultimately on on our lifestyle change. It's just changes to agriculture, which rests ultimately on uh, you know, what we have what we do with diets. So the kind of rich discussion here is going to happen in a number of ways. It's not just about place. It's also about those changes to the fundamentals like diet. And I, I'd rather we were kind of framing up those challenges uh, in, in that way, rather than talking just about net zero, but talking about changes more generally in, in, in lifestyles over the next 20 and 30 years. And there are lots and lots of what the economists would call co-benefits for acting on these things that happen to reduce emissions, but have all sorts of other positive benefits. So, you know, eating less meat tends to be a healthier diet, for example, 
uh, you know, the, the, the changes that we're seeing on local high streets, for example, we can frame those things up as being a move to, you know, less travel, less use of fossil fuels to move around a bit more, you know, that, that kind of, you know, those sorts of questions are, are, are not easily managed from a desk in Whitehall. So I, I'd quite like to see us set them up in the right way so that we're not just talking about climate, not just talking about net zero, but instead talking about a whole tapestry of changes that lie ahead. And the last thing I'll say on this is that the danger in thinking about you know, citizens assemblies and, and, and those sorts of approaches is, is, is in viewing them as just big focus groups. You know, somehow you get this group of people together and then you bring back a set of policy recommendations to Whitehall again and they are implemented there. They're not like that. I think that you can use these participative approaches in different ways to arrive at better solutions, uh, as well as the, the kind of data that Darren and I might need in our in our day to day. So I, I'd like to see these things happen more frequently and to broaden out beyond just discussing net zero, which is a challenge in itself. Thank you. Becky, did you want to come Yeah, in I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether you were getting at barriers to net zero or barriers to this kind of deliberative approach in terms of barriers to this kind of deliberative approach. I mean, the conversations that I've had with um, politicians and political advisors and so on, it's interesting that there's the criticism that that, that, that um, climate assemblies and the like seem to be seen as both too powerful and not powerful enough. <laughs> so um, too powerful is something that, you know, that, 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 that politicians worry about in a, in, in a sense that it's replacing their role. You know, you get this, you get this, you get politicians saying, oh, but we're elected to represent um, the people. So it just confuses things if you have a separate body. Um, and not powerful enough, because obviously there's a big question, as Dermot pointed out, about what you do with the recommendations and whether they get taken forward and a real worry that they won't. So, I mean, which of these is right? I mean, I think the way to square that circle is to is to point out that um, these sorts of processes are about getting better social intelligence. As Darren was saying, though, as Darren was saying that, you know, the, the Climate Assembly is being used in committees as a kind of starting point for, you know, the evidence from that is being used as a starting point for um, what citizens' views and values are. And and you know once you get across the idea that um, you can that, that that better social intelligence enables you to make better decisions, um, then you know you get over those you know you get over both those complaints that they're you know too powerful and yet not powerful enough. And so what I would like to see linked to that is just a much more widespread use of you know, what you might call deliberative processes. So citizens assemblies, citizens juries at local level, we've seen loads of those that it's, it's brilliant to see those. But also, I mean, the current, you know, the, the I mean, Institute for Government will be all over this, but the way that we do consultation in terms of the six week consultation is, you know, sterile and tedious and encourages uh, vested interests and not that many more people to come forward. So that whether we could build deliberation into the model of, of, of policy consultation, um, white papers, green papers, strategies, whatever that might be, I think that's where we need to look and that's where um, that that's the research that I'm doing now in partnership with with Chris's committee and and others looking at how we can embed um, a, a sort of a deliberative system into the, the way that we do politics. Um, I'm aware we've got about 15 minutes left uh, so I want to go to some audience questions now we've got almost 100 piling up um, so there are quite a few questions in the don't we just need to get on with this category and um, so I'll, I'll put one of those to uh, to the four of you is the challenge on zero emissions domestic heat not akin to the current vaccination strategy i.e it just has to be rolled out otherwise there won't be time to complete the task what do you think is there an argument for just getting on with it <laughs> It's such a difficult question. Is it like the vaccination strategy? No, absolutely not. I mean, it is a much more fundamental thing to talk about what changes we will need to see in the home over the next 20 or 30 years. But it's like it in the sense that we really do need to start the process of, of getting on with it. I mean, I, and for me, that I, I've said this a few times now, that starts with, with beginning to plan. And there's a real practical need for those plans. We need local plans, regional plans for the heat decarbonisation uh, story that will play out over the next 20, 30 years or Ofgem is not going to be able to sanction all the investment that needs to happen over the course of the next 20, 30 years. So that, you know, back to what I said at the start of this, the story of the last 15 years has been this very centrally planned central policy 
uh, big energy companies receiving that policy and acting on it. That's been that's been really good. You know, that's what's driven us to the the place where we are today with um with with sharp falls in 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 carbon emissions from uh, power production in this country. The next stage needs to have a much more, uh, frankly, interesting discussion about how you achieve those atomized changes I talked about in millions of homes across the country. But it plays back into the next big centrally planned questions as well about what you do with the energy networks. So unless you start with the process of engaging at local level about what sort of plan people want for heat decarbonisation and building retrofit, which doesn't sound very sexy as we're talking about it this morning, but unless that process is framed up and begun, then we won't get to the big questions of how much investment we need and how the energy networks are going to develop. And, and for me, that that you know that story is something that we have known for a while, and we've been we've been we've been procrastinating on it. So we need to get going on on opening up the question about what it means for me and my home in Scotland, and what it might mean for someone living in I don't know Cornwall, which is going to be a very different you know question overall. We have to accept that there's going to be a, a, a tapestry of solutions across the country. Back to my opening point that we can be optimistic and positive about those changes, but it won't happen unless we present people with the opportunity to engage with it. Thanks, Chris. Did any um, other panel members want to come in on that? I mean, just a point on getting on with it. I suppose the question is, what what do you mean by it? Um, so, you know, on the technology side, I, I won't go into all the detail, but, you know, we know that there's still more work to be done um, on all of the different technologies available for decarbonising heat, for example. But one thing you can get on with is the engagement with the public. And I'm not I'm not quite suggesting someone running through the country with an Olympic torch, but something similar to that when you know something is coming to your local town. And I'm, I'm look, people aren't going to queue up on the street to listen to a briefing on hydrogen, but, you know, some form of national led conversation that is driven locally and people can see it coming to their local area um, I think would be a good use of time whilst we're still figuring out and hopefully as quickly as possible some of the kind of infrastructure and research and financing issues for the technologies that are going to have to be coming into people's homes. Thank you. I mean just just to say really quickly Emma, I mean if, if you do just get on with it without explaining and without providing the incentives it, it will come back and bite you on the backside and you know politicians actually know that because they you know they they talk to people and and i think the the climate community um needs to to to, to really dig into that question a bit more thank you um another question we've got is are there any lessons to be learned or opportunities to seize based on the very different style of public engagement during the COVID-19 pandemic? So whether that's um, more presentation and transparency around charts and data to encouraging citizenship and community led responses. I mean, there's probably lessons learned on how not to engage the public um, through certain aspects of COVID, to be honest. But I do think that you could, uh, you know, in, in a similar vein, you know, there, the Prime Minister could lead a press conference from number 10 with some data and presentations on, you know, the, the, the climate emergency that we're facing and the reason that there's being leadership from Downing Street on the transition that's going to affect everybody in their homes and every community across the country. Um, I think you sometimes it might be symbolic, but I think it's symbolically important that it's not just um, you know, an energy minister in a department releasing a white paper that all of us go to and listen to, but it's something that really cuts through with the public and makes sure that it's kind of registered as something that's going to affect them in the future. So I think that kind of national messaging um, and the role of government communications, we don't, we've seen some great communications on, you know, promoting the vaccine and the safety record and having celebrities and others kind of persuading the public to take up the vaccine. Some of that stuff um, in the future on decarbonisation I think would be a good lesson to learn from the, the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Another question um, on COP26. What is the best framework to enable the public to participate in COP26 and have a voice there, given the decisions that are made will impact everybody for generations to come? So I'm conscious I asked the last question, but I think that maybe that's directed to me, so I'll give it a go. I mean, okay. there's, a, there's, a, there's a big known unknown here, which is actually is what is COP going to look like in November? You know, it's, it's not going to be like it was every other time when you've got hundreds of people and officials and uh, interested groups turning up to a place and having a conversation with each other. So what we don't know is on the scale of 
cancelled <laughs> or entirely online uh, up to some form of physical presence how that's going to land so the cabinet office is having to think at the moment about how you build that ability to scale in whichever direction you need to go in to make it happen one of the opportunities though using digital technologies and certainly from a constituency perspective um, i've seen many many more constituents now become much more comfortable in using online technologies and engaging in that way is to be able to expand the ability to engage the public compared to previous cops because there's uh, you know there's always i think in certain parts of the kind of um uh cop community an eagerness to get tickets or certain access rights or to certain events at COP, um, whereas actually for the public it's probably a little bit more difficult. So I think we should do much more online engagement around some of the key issues that we're that we're discussing and, and being able to explain those as well because some of the big issues will be around you know carbon pricing and border tariffs and some quite dense issues but would actually have a real impact on certain businesses and jobs and the way in which we do business and we could probably learn again from the citizens assembly example with you know people like uh, colleagues on the panel here who have got experience of explaining these often dense issues in a way that is easy to understand and engage with thank you did any of the rest of the panel want to come in on cop 26 and public engagement Okay, in which on case I'm going to go, we've only got a few minutes left to um, another question. We've got a lot of questions coming in on how you balance public engagement with political leadership. Um, are there other circumstances where government should avoid asking the public? What is the balance between understanding citizen preferences and showing leadership on the big calls? Becky. I, I, I really don't think it's an either or. I, I think that the best way to develop political leadership on that on this is for politicians to have greater confidence about public support and greater understanding of where the dilemmas and where some of the um, you know you know where where some of the uncertainties lie. So, I mean, the, actually, the reason that I got into um, citizens' assemblies and deliberative processes as an idea is because of my research into um, uh, politicians' attitudes to climate change and um, uncovering this, this, this idea that actually um, politicians did not think that there was public support um, and, and, and that they underestimated levels of public support or they were really unsure about how um, some some of these climate policies might play out. So I absolutely don't think it's an either or. Of course, we need political leadership and we need political leaders and actually leaders from across all walks of life to be very upfront about the climate crisis, not to pull any pun punches about what happens if we get to two degrees or God forbid anything beyond that. That is absolutely needed, that level of leadership from anyone who has profile and influence. Um, but the way that you will get that out of politicians is by building that better understanding of what people will support and how you can build that sort of social contract between citizens and, and politicians. Thank you, Dermot. Yeah, just a, a quick follow up. I uh, agree with everything that you said. Um, and to give one example from the Irish context, not, not on climate change, but on, on abortion, which was one of the other topics that has been considered by a citizens' assembly in, in Ireland. For, for, for several decades, there was a constitutional ban on abortion um, because of the legacy of the involvement of the Catholic Church in, in, in the running of the state in, in Ireland. It was a topic that politicians just didn't want to. To touch, uh, and uh, so it was. It was given to a citizens' assembly, and the the output of that citizens' assembly was uh, a recommendation of uh, of two to one, a vote of the the participants two to one in favour of removing that constitutional ban. Uh, and when that when that result from the citizens' assembly was first reported, and um, there was a feeling in wider society that. There must have been something wrong with the selection process that this it wasn't representative of the Irish public. But but subsequently there was a, a referendum to re, uh, on the question of removing that constitutional ban uh, fr from the constitution, and the public voted two thirds in favour, almost mirroring almost exactly what the what the citizens' assembly had had come up with. So just to, to uh, emphasise what Becky was, was saying that these processes give an opportunity for, for us to find out where, where the population stands. And, and as Becky's previous research has shown, politicians often uh, underestimate the, the level of support for public support for, for climate action. Thank you. 
And I think this is probably going to have to be our last question, um, one um, from Novo Nordisk. How should governments and their arms length bodies, particularly the NHS in the UK, support the public to make more sustainable choices? And is there anything that we can learn from the kind of social innovation that's been embraced in Scandinavia? Chris, did you want well, to well, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that, except to say that I think we should trust them. So, I mean, that, that's coming out of all of the all of the, the answers that you're hearing today. I mean, I, I have to say that my experience, I was involved as well with the, the uh, Climate Assembly uh, last year, and, and I was a bit of a, not a sceptic so much as someone who's a bit unsure about where it would lead when I first started on it. But I've, I've, I've come to the conclusion that these things are really powerful. And indeed, you should trust the people once they once you have armed them with the information. They're 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 deeply involved. They can be deeply involved in in coming up with solutions. So uh, yes, there is a. I'm sure there is a, a certain amount of social innovation that we can we can do. And I'm certain we could learn from other countries that do this differently. And and I'll make my final point here, which is that we are not going to get to net zero uh, and see the changes that we need to see over the next 30 years by sitting in Whitehall and planning it uh, and and expecting that we'll get all the answers. So, you know, that for me is is an exciting proposition. This it, it, it's a requirement of net zero that we have to broaden out into a much richer discussion of the changes that lie ahead in the UK. Thank you, Chris. Um, final comments from the rest of the panel. Darren. Um, I, I would I would just say that, that there is a challenge for Whitehall and Westminster, though, which is this is not a departmental responsibility um, and it can't be his departmental responsibility. This is one of these issues that needs to transcend every arm and function of government at every level of the constitution. And um, as Chris said, that means you've just got to set that mandate from Downing Street, but then trust the departments and the organisations uh, that deliver public services to kind of entwine that in their delivery of services in the way that makes the most sense in their in their context. The one thing I would say, of course, is that, you know, we've got some huge challenges, but we've made enormous progress as well in the last couple of years. It really wasn't that long ago um, that, you know, people in Westminster thought that this whole climate thing was really only for I don't know, pro-European vegan lefties from Bristol like me, um, whereas now everybody gets it. And that's why the government is putting so much effort into these issues. And, you know, we've seen the front pages of the Express and the Sun leading on green transition campaigns. I mean, this is not the type of thing we've seen before. So, you know, we, we have got some kind of motion going on here that we just need to make sure we keep keep on as we get into the difficult decisions about how we actually make decisions in different parts of the country. Darren, thank you. Um, Dimit, over to you, um, 30 seconds. Um, I, I, I don't have a particularly good, good answer to, to, um, to, to that, that, that question, but I guess just to, to echo what, what Chris and, and, and Darren have, have said, I, I, I think, uh, and, and to uh, all, all the, the comments of, of the panel, that we, we really need social innovation, we really need to bring the, the, the public uh, along, but but more than that, and uh, maybe echoing your point, Becky made, we need and um, we need to be guided and led by by the public, uh, and and maybe just to echo Becky's earlier point about pushing back about the question that we that we were set. It's not about government bringing the the public along with with them. It's it's about the public and government co-creating the, the the future that we want to see. Thank you, and um, Becky, and um, you get the final say um, on the panel. Last word, excellent. I mean, I think I thought I would leave you with is that I think what the Climate Assembly and similar processes have showed us is that it's not just about, you know, their, their role in climate action, but actually their role in um, in democratic reform and renewal. And I should actually leave the last word to Sue, one of our Assembly members who spoke at the launch, who um, as a result of her involvement in Climate Assembly UK, she's brought a second hand um, electric vehicle, but she's also become a parish councillor. And, you know, before she didn't realise that she, she, did, she didn't think about her role in the political process and now she's stuck into local politics. So I think that is, you know, maybe something really positive to end with. Brilliant. Thanks, Becky. Definitely an inspiring note to finish on. Um, so I'm going to have to draw it to a close there. Thank you so much to our brilliant panellists. Um, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, thank you to you, the audience, for a fascinating set of questions. I'm sorry I couldn't even touch the side of the uh, 100 or so questions that we were asked. Um, so this is part of a day long conference on delivering net zero. The next event starts at 12.30 and is looking at what needs to be done to deliver net zero. And um, delivery is one of the most under discussed aspects of the target. So I thoroughly encourage you all to tune in. Um, thanks again. Um, bye. <laughs>